Hello, I'm Jenna Poff Gray, founder and artistic director of Forward Theatre Company. And this is Theatre Forward, a twice monthly conversation about theatre from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theatre in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 36 of Theatre Forward. For this episode, I am thrilled to have the chance to talk with Michael Barakiva, the artistic director of Hangar Theatre in Ithaca, New York. We're going to be talking about some of the strange new aspects of our jobs leading small professional theaters right now. And Michael and I are, of course, also joined by Theater Forward's producer, Scott Hayden. And Michael, welcome to Theater Forward. Thank you so much for having me, Jen. I'm so happy to be here. We have had a an online email, et cetera, acquaintance for a while now, but it's it's wonderful to get to talk to you voice to voice, if not in person. It's like love letters, but about theater instead of <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, can you just start to introduce yourself, you know, a little bit about your career and about the Hangar Theater as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, um, I am an Israeli-Armenian-American. I was born in Israel and we moved to the States when I was a kid, just a kid. Um, and I grew up in this country in New Jersey, which I like to describe as far scarier than Israel. Um, and then I did my undergraduate at Vassar College, where I was a drama and English double major, and then I went into Juilliard Directing Program, um, which is where I worked with Chris Stone for the first time, as you and I were just talking about that. Um, and then I got out of school, and I got this great um, sort of unlikely gig. I was a Mark Brokaw's assistant director on Old Money, which was Wendy Wasserstein's play at Lincoln Center, and then Wendy hired me to be her typist for the last five years of her life. So I got to work with her very closely and very intimately. Um, I mean, I think I typed everything that she wrote in those years, including Third, which um, I got to collaborate with her on in its early incarnations. And, um, and then I think like many freelance directors who are lucky enough to work, you know, I worked at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and I um, worked at Syracuse Stage, but I sort of started wondering like, the struggle is so hard and so real, and we're so desperate for work, and then we get work, and then there's this moment of, I, I, of me asking myself sort of like, now what? Like, what do we do now as artists, and how do we try to make the world a better place? And I answer that question in lots of different ways for myself over the course of my 30s. And one of them is that I started a little company in New York called The Upstart Creatures that is still going, and we do a reading of a large, commercially your often international play in a church off of Times Square, the Metro Baptist Church. And then we create a meal inspired by that play, a gourmet three-course meal that we serve to the 100 people who come and we do it all for free. And that is like sort of our way to try to give back to the community in Manhattan. Um, I also became a young adult novelist. I've written two books. The first one is One Man Guy and the second is a standalone sequel, Hold My Hand. And they are um, both queer young adult novels um, and then the opportunity to be the interim artistic director at the Hangar um, presented itself to me, and I had done a directing fellowship there through the Drama League when I was 24 years old, and I had such great memories of the place, and I thought, this is fun and weird and hard, and I had no idea how hard it would be, so I served as the interim there for one year, and then I applied and was uh, appointed to the full-time position, and so I've been serving as the full-time artistic director since 2017. And oh, the adventures we've all had running small theaters in this country during the last few months, especially. And how I love that we both uh, cut our teeth as uh, assistants to some uh, some directors back in New York. That was my my starting ground as well. Yeah, I well, you that. know, I think there's this thing. Um, the next young adult novel I'm writing is like in the sort of fantasy genre with a queer protagonist, but I I want to write about this. I want to use the model that this country is using to train directors, which I think is good and complicated, which is that basically we all train in cities and then we get dispersed around the country and have a totally different set of aesthetics and morals and understanding, often as outsiders to the communities that we're serving in. And I want to write about like a school for wizards that does the same thing and like <laughs> how complicated it is for like a wizard who has to like live in a rural area when they've grown up and trained in a city their whole life and the sort of culture shock that comes with that. I love that. Well, and there's something else you said that really resonated with me because it really parallels some of my own career, which was that sense of um, reaching a point where you say, 
okay, but what, what am I doing for the world? You know, um, yeah. tikkun olam, what, how are we, how are we making the world a better place? And, and really for me, having found that and running forward and not only having the opportunity, of course, I still get to direct and create art in a rehearsal room, but also to hire other directors and hire playwrights and hire actors and designers and technicians and put a lot of people to work and, and choose pieces that hopefully impact community conversation and build that long-term relationship with an audience that you just don't get working in New York. Yeah, and also like about thinking to yourself, you know, like especially, you know, um, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and the enormous EDI work and the confrontation of white supremacy that all of us have to do in the American theater, you know, the, there is this kernel of thinking like, what are the plays that I don't, I'm not qualified to direct? What are the plays that other people could direct better for aesthetic or other reasons? And how thrilling is it to try to provide a home and a home base for them to do that work? 100%. We are on 100% the same page. It is magnificent. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, Hangar Theater and, and the, the kind of company that you are and the work that you do. Well, the Hangar is... Um, we are entering our 46th season, and um, for the first 36 years, The Hangar was uh, just a summer theater. So they would open it up on Memorial Day and seal it up on Labor Day. It's a 349-seat thrust stage in a converted uh, airport slash airplane factory, hence Hangar with an A. Um, and, um, you know, Bob Moss, uh, served as artistic director for a long stretch early on, which is, I think, how The Hangar got on the national map. And then 10 years ago, The Hangar led a $4 million campaign to renovate the space to become a full-year facility. So now, in addition to all of our summer work, we act as a home base for many of the arts organizations in Ithaca, and Ithaca is one of the richest per capita art scenes in this country. Um, you know, there are three chamber orchestras, a ballet, an opera, three other professional theater companies. And we also work uh, during the year, we serve as a venue for musical acts. We've also been doing a winter holiday show. And, um, and then and during the summer, in addition to our five main stage plays, we have a Kid Stuff series, which is for you know, audience members, children that our lab company performs. We also do the Wedge series, which is our collaboration with the Drama League directors. So we take four early or mid-career directors and they work with our lab company. Um, we also do a cabaret series. I mean, we, we sort of try to think of ourselves as a little theater community onto ourselves in the summer for it to get the people passing through. That's, that's fantastic. It really is. It's like we're finding our parallel company. We also are a 349-seat thrust <laughs> theater in a college town that is very arts-rich per capita. So yeah, there's a lot of overlap. Sorry, did somebody um, say co-production? I know, I know. We'll we'll talk offline. Um, uh, well, you and I, you know, we we have some colleagues in common. You know, yours is certainly a name that I've I've heard many times. But what really brought us into direct communication this year, and I've had a number of um, instances like this brought on by the COVID circumstances, um, is that. I have just found, and I, I would love to talk about this with you, our colleagues, people want to talk to each other now. Yeah, yeah. We are, there's a recognition of how much we need each other because all of us are dealing with completely unprecedented circumstances. None of us have been trained on what to do during a global pandemic when you're running a theater company, um, and then all of the other um, circumstances that are surrounding that. And... I got this wonderful email from you back in, I want to say late March, um, basically reaching out and saying that you had decided to make a plan that you were going to connect with every artistic director of a, an equity SPT theater company. And for those listening who don't know, Actors Equity Association, the Union of Professional Actors and Stage Managers, has different tiers of contracts. There's Broadway, there's Lort, which is the large regional theater companies, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the tiers is called the small professional theaters, um, usually annual budgets under a million, under $10 million, that sort of thing. Um, and you reached out because there has been no common communications venue for people leading theater companies of our size ever before, to our knowledge. Yeah. And you just decided to start one. And I thought that was amazing. Well, you know, in, in, in the sort of, in the 
chaos of the of March, when all of us were trying to figure out, are we going to cancel? Are we going to pivot? What are we going to do? I did feel this unique need to reach out to other artistic directors, especially because the managing director of the Hangar Theater had just stepped down, and Nicole Gancher, who is starting with us in July, we knew wouldn't be arriving until July. So suddenly I felt really sort of adrift. And I wanted to know what other people were thinking and how they were engaging the unique obstacles and challenges we were facing. So I had Holly Ann Bucci, who is our artistic producing fellow. I said, find as many artistic directors as SBTs and just email them. And we, I, I, I think, did we have your email address or did it come into the info at, do you remember? I don't even remember. <laughs> that feels like six <laughs> lifetimes ago. Yeah, send them out like pigeons with messages. <laughs> you know, has the water receded? Will anybody answer? <laughs> Um, and now we have a Slack group where all of us who run theaters roughly the same size all over the country get to ask each other questions and get answers, and it's amazing. It's really, it's really been an incredible resource, and it's it, it's so exciting to me thinking about the fact that this resource is now here for us, not dur during this, just during this crisis, but after it, and as we come out of it, and as we rebuild, and as we dream about what the future looks like, um, it's it's really thrilling. Um, you know, there's a number of different calls that I get to participate in regularly, you know, with, with local Madison area theaters, with statewide professional theaters, um, some of the national conferences and things, but, but to get to talk to artistic directors of companies our size is just so incredibly useful. Um, and it's, it's always crazy that it seems to take a crisis to yeah. create the opportunity for something like this, but I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I'm just thrilled and, it's there now. I know, you know, one of the things that I have been, you know, sort of whispering to myself to try to get myself to go to sleep at night is that it, uh, crisis leads to innovation, crisis leads to innovation. And there are so many things, you know, like rehearsing online, which I'm amazed at how successful the rehearsals online have been. And, uh, and we are thinking to ourselves like, oh, maybe we will, even when we can rehearse live, maybe the first few rehearsals can happen online or... Maybe somebody can get Skype into a room. And I have a lot of hope that our artistic leadership group will stay and lead to all kinds of connections, not just like the ones we're having now, but ones we haven't even been able to predict yet. Yeah, so tell me about um, producing online, because I know you've been moving yeah. your summer season. We here at Forward, we just did our first real online uh, content with our new play festival that was moved onto Zoom and was just um, you know done at the end of June. Uh, but you've gotten a little more deeply into those those waters. So tell me about what that's been like. Well, you know, it's the the real fun of it. And th the more uh, I, I serve as an artistic director, the more I feel the temptation to engage things from financial, financial or logistic parameters, and the more I resist it like a tide threatening to carry me under. So the, the most interesting part about it is that there are artistic possibilities that it unleashes. Like, um, we just did an event called Uncommon Excerpts, which, uh, Uncommon Excerpts and Others, which was a compilation of Wendy Wasserstein's scenes and essays. And one of my super far smart friends who watched it said, oh, you know, the reading of the essays, I'm not sure how that would have been dramatized on a stage, but in a Zoom format, it actually made a lot of sense just to have things being read to me in that way. And, and I thought, oh, that's interesting that there is something sort of academic about Zoom. There's something uh, declamatory about it. So... We're really excited for the kind of material that lives well in this format. We're also really excited about experimenting with visual things. How can we create banners like that create a sort of Brechtian element that help format the event, the artistic event? How can we create images? And that can either be um, like a visual effect of fading an image in and out or superimposing an image onto somebody speaking or... Um, you know, we're, we're like really excited about what the possibilities are and how the different material lends itself to it. Um, and then, of course, there are the ways that the geography, you know, geography is such a constraint in live theater that we just assume, we've just taken it for granted. But now we can rehearse plays with people all over the country. Um, our board president's mother lives in Washington State, and she can now see the plays at the Hangar Theater. My mother-in-law, Margarita. She lives in Mexico City, and she can see our plays now. And so we're also thrilled to be able to reach out to people we wouldn't be able to engage otherwise. Yeah, just the, the festival we just did. There were two 
two actors in particular who've worked with us in the past. Um, but one has recently, you know, Olivia Dawson has starred on our stage before, but now she's living in Georgia. We were able to bring her in for the reading because she was yeah. perfect for the part and we didn't have to worry about getting her here. And Shantae Miller, a wonderful young actress who starred in a couple of our shows. She's now a student at Juilliard and is in, in New York, but we were able to get her back again. Um, and that's certainly nothing we would have been able to do for the new play festival. Um, and yeah, I've got a lot of New York family that are excited. We've, we've just announced that the first uh, main stage show of our fall season is going to be fully online in part because of restrictions on rehearsing in public, uh, as well as the um, limitations for the, the building we perform in, which is going to stay closed for a while longer. Um, but I've got a lot of New York family that are very excited to get to see a full forward production completely on their screens. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also, I think, you know, like you're talking about the ability to bring artists back that your community is familiar with. One of the one of the pieces of input that we've been getting from our audience members, which is not something that I thought about, but specifically in those situations, as they just said, in this time of isolation, what a relief it was for them to see familiar faces. Just seeing the faces on their screen. Our our first cyber event was the Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder, and we have such a rich. Uh, actor and artist community in Ithaca that we just made the decision to cast all 25 roles from people who call the Finger Lakes region their home. And uh, so many audience members wrote to us and said, oh, it was so nice to see Erica's face. It was so nice to see Cynthia's face. Just to see, because we all feel we're so lonely. You know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is, yeah, it's everything. And it's, you know, I, I keep talking, um, you know, with, with members of our company and our board and audience members you know, I think that there is, I certainly feel this, this great hunger and yearning to be able to, to go and do theater the way we are yeah. used to doing it, where we are bodies together in a room, creating our art, telling our story, and then assembling with the audience, the final characters in the play and, and you know, breathing the same air, which didn't used to seem like such a dangerous right. idea. And, and of course, I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that as soon as it is safe to do so. But this pause, this intermission, this, you know, sort of um, detour, cul-de-sac that we're in right now, it doesn't have to be all a negative thing. There is a tremendous amount of creativity, innovation. I mean, I'm looking at your face here on our Zoom screen, Scott, the learning that you've been doing to, to put our work on stage over these last months and by on stage, I mean on screen. It's 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 both daunting, but also incredibly exciting. All of the new innovation and creativity that is coming out of um, out of this, and like you said, the opportunity that's being bred, and the sort of revitalization that's maybe happening as a result of this. I mean, what do you think, Scott? It, you know, it opened up doing the the new play festival online. It, it opened up doing it virtually. Opened up all sorts of opportunities that you couldn't do on stage, believe it or not. Um, and I think it also I think it also opened our content up to a different audience um, that is that is open to that kind of an experience. That maybe the maybe the the on stage experience has sort of eluded them throughout their lives, but but identifying with something that is in a video format. Um, is something that they were comfortable with, um, and then I think that they were. I think a lot of people were su surprised at how much they enjoyed it. Do you, are you getting any feedback like that from your audiences? Yeah, there. You know, um, there's a lot. There are a lot of questions. There were a lot of questions early on with the technology, and we made sure. You know, we were. Um, our entire staff went down a small percent when the pandemic happened as a financial measure, but we were able to retain our full time staff. So we were very grateful for that. And before our first event, we all became sort of like a geek squad. Like we were all trained on like how to tell people how to use this and get the YouTube on your TV because we really wanted it to be like a, um, a living room experience, not an office experience. And we just did, I think, what theater does best, which is we focused on the positive. So, you know, there are no lines for the restroom. You can, you can talk during the show and nobody's going to shush you. You can have candy. You can unwrap as much hard candy as you want without me giving you evil eyes from the back of the house. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. And like, and like you, Jen, I'm so hungry to get back to live theater and I can't wait for it. But I think, you know, like all of us theater people, we, um, we're not in it for the money and 
all of us regional theater people are not really in it for the glory either. Like we have a mission and we want to be able to do that mission and we will do that in whatever format we can until we can do it in the format we want. That is, I couldn't have said that better myself. I mean, that has been exactly our commitment. And, you know, as, as each new curveball is getting thrown, it seems like at our heads over these last months, <laughs> um, you know, we just, we just keep coming up with different scenarios and different plans and flow charts and all of that. But it's all coming down to how do we fulfill our mission. And for us, it's, it's how do we keep the audience that is committed to us engaged and give, it, give them stories and hope and art during, you know, times of crisis? And how do we keep the local artists community employed so that yeah. they are afloat? And, and, and everything we're doing is really like, okay, is it helping us achieve those two goals? Then that's what we'll do. And, you know, all other bets of all, you know, other sort of grand plans and, and goals are, are kind of on the table you know, that everything's sort of on hold for, for now. But if we can if we can keep fulfilling our base mission while we get through this, I think we can all just feel real proud. I think so too. And it's so it's that's that's so beautifully articulated. And um, you know, and even just he, hearing you like in, in talk, like you're talking about the curveballs getting thrown at our head and you were talking <laughs> about this as an intermission or a cul-de-sac, is that like theater is metaphor rich. And so mm. You know, like we we are a medium of metaphor, and there is a way to find that on Zoom through image and through um, through sound. And we like again, I have loved one of my favorite things is seeing what actors have in their wardrobes and the fun that they have <laughs> creating different costumes and different effects. You know, uh, Susanna Berryman is a much beloved Ithaca performer of many decades. And when she played the fortune teller in Skin of Our Teeth, she had like somehow created an entire fortune teller booth in her in her house, and she was costumed. I mean, it was like it was a production rich experience. So, so Michael, let me ask you this: As you look, I mean, so you're in the middle of your summer season, and before we finish, I want to hear about like what what's coming up next there. But as you look beyond your current summer season and you look at this year ahead, you know what are the big things that you're kind of focusing on what are your well, what are your what's yeah. keeping you up at night <laughs> so you know i think and you know Jen, i think this is where you and i are having a really um complimentary experience because i think the people that are on the full year schedule have such a different experience about how this is affecting programming than those of us who are on a primarily summer schedule so when it first came around i thought like oh of course we'll be able to do plays by the summer i feel bad for all those theaters that have to cancel their march or april productions you know and then when it became clear, you know, so then in, in the midst of our pivoting, we basically created four budgets and we created like a budget with no summer programming, a uh, budget with entirely virtual summer programming and two sort of hybrid budgets, you know, in the possibility that we could do something live in August, which of course feels uh, ludicrous now. Today they announced that Broadway wouldn't, you know, was canceled through the rest of the calendar year. Even January of 21 might be early for, yeah. I mean, it's, it's terrifying. So. So now that it's sort of inverted, you full year theaters have to figure out how many plays are going to move online. Will it be possible to do live plays? We're thinking for summer of 21 and really just keeping our fingers crossed that we will be able to congregate live by then. And if not, thinking about, well, is it another virtual season? Is it an outdoor season? And I'm hoping my production manager does not listen to this because he has <laughs> very strong feelings about doing plays outdoors and they are not positive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it, I know exactly what you're saying. We've been having similar conversations with with colleagues here in Wisconsin running summer companies and that sort of ebb and flow of um, feeling, uh, you know, sad for and envious of our, our fellow producers as, as we've gone through this process. And this is a, a, a circumstance where I feel like we are very fortunate to be running companies sort of in the size that we are uh, at Hangar, at Forward. You know, we, we have enough resources to be able to do some sort of pivoting and to have, you know, some staff to help us figure these things out. But we're also not such a big ocean liner of a ship that we can't make adjustments. I mean, as we look at this, you know, sort of regular year season ahead, starting in September, we we're kind of deciding show by show. It's amazing. What, what's the scenario for the September one? Great. That one's going to have to be entirely online. What's the, for the November show, we're going to bump that to next spring because we have one slot we can bump something into. What about January? Well, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that maybe that can be rehearsed in person and have a small live audience. Who knows? But we feel like we can at least decide 
on a rolling basis versus a blanket decision for the whole year. And that helps a lot. Totally. And it is, like you said, it is a real luxury for theater companies of our size. You know, The Hangar is, I think, the largest arts organization in the Ithaca area. So in, in, in the local scene, we feel like uh, a really big player. But in the national scene, we, you know, we're just like, and when I've been to national conferences um, and they have like, uh, I've, I've, some of the sessions just feel so irrelevant to a theater of our size, which is why having a community of like, you know, we're a 1.5, normally we're a $1.5 million theater. We will be much smaller this year. Um, but we, it, it does allow us an agility and an ability to pivot that larger organizations uh, don't necessarily enjoy. And also, and this is really personal, but our current landlord, which is Travis Hyde, and we were supposed to move offices in the midst of this pandemic. <laughs> and our future landlord is the Tompkins Trust Company. And both of them have been really understanding about our situation. And that has allowed us also a kind of agility that we wouldn't have if we had a large overhead. Yeah, yeah. So tell me um, a little bit more about what's coming up still this summer, because folks listening, uh, even if they're local to us here in Wisconsin, they can come and see some productions at Hangar Theater. So what's coming up? Okay, well, we have the one show that we were supposed to do in 2020 that we were able to secure the sort of virtual rights for was Queen's Girl in the World, which is a um, this Stunningly beautiful piece. Uh, Shirley Sarotsky, who's the Associate Artistic Director at The Hangar, when she was running Theater J, she produced the world premiere of it. And um, it's about a Black girl in Queens in the 60s, sort of in this Motown-infused world. It's her coming-of-age story, and her story acts as a lens through which to see the entire civil rights movement. And it is a gorgeous piece, and we are so grateful to um, Godfrey Simmons, who's directing it, and um, to Kelly Jennings, who's the playwright, who is letting us do a virtual version of it, sort of as a sneak peek this summer. That show is July 11th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern EDT. Um, so what's the time difference between us? Is it one or two hours? One hour. So that would be 6.30 your time. And then um, <clears throat> our next show, is um, we're calling it Honk Your Horn, and it was originally conceived as sort of a celebration of musical theater because The Hangar always does a mus at least one musical in the summer. And given everything that has happened in the world in the last few weeks, especially with Black Lives Matter and um, in response to the murder of George Floyd, we have sort of decided to um, repurpose that event as a uh, to let um, BIPOC artists who have performed at The Hangar's main stage in the past sort of select songs that they personally feel like are speaking to the moment that they're living in right now. We called it Honk Your Horn because Austin Scott, who starred as Benny in our production of In the Heights, and then went on to play Hamilton in the musical with the same name. Um, he was the first artist we reached art out to about this, and he agreed to headline it. And Honk Your Horn is both uh, one of Benny's songs in In the Heights, and in the pandemic has become this really sort of hopeful gesture but I am really excited for how this event is being reimagined and really grateful also for Jerry McIntyre, who's coming on as a co-director. Uh, Jerry did our production of Kinky Boots last summer, which I think is the most, certainly the most successful production since I've been at The Hangar. Um, and then our, that is July 25th. And if I could, could finish my little plug for our shows, mm -hmm. we are doing on August 8th at 7.30 PM, we're doing uh, Sense and Sensibility by Kate Hamill. Kate grew up in the Ithaca area and acted for the first time in her life at the Hangar stage and went to Ithaca College before becoming one of the five most produced playwrights in this country. And this was her first sort of big off-Broadway hit, so we're really excited to do it and to do it with her and her husband, Jason, in the roles that they originated off-Broadway. So we air the show, and then there's a three-day window after which you can see the show as per our agreement with the union. That is a really fantastic season. I'm looking forward to checking those out. I can't wait to have you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I feel like we could easily keep this going for another hour or two, <laughs> but uh, in the interest of our typical podcast length, I think we will we will wrap this up. But maybe we'll 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 revisit again for another conversation down yeah. the road. I, I, I'm so grateful for the invitation, Jen and Scott, and also so grateful to um, like meet colleagues and to learn about how much we have in common and to see what the future holds for our institution. 
Indeed. Um, so we'll say that that's all for this episode of Theater Forward, a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and America. Thank you for joining us. Our thanks to Michael Barakiba for joining me for this conversation, and we encourage you to visit the Hangar Theater's website to learn more about their upcoming online events. Our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden, and you can follow us or share your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter at Theater Forward, as always, with an E-R. And if you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to subscribe to, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform, and be sure to leave a review. We're so grateful to have you listening, and we will be back soon for another Theater Forward conversation. <laughs>